What's up, everyone? It's Kanan, and welcome back to another episode of Ruby Alternate Realities. What if Yang was a Saiyan? I believe this is part eight, and we will officially be moving into the Atlas portion of the story. Now, last episode, I told you guys that I would be pretty much saving the reveal of what Salem is in this version, and I went out of my way to really draw home that she is not immortal in this version. I don't like immortal villains. Um, that's one of my biggest worries about Ruby is how are they going to play that off later? Now, of course, there's a lot of great theories out there, but I wanted to avoid that in this story. But yes, last episode, Blake and Yang took on Adam and Yang unlocked all Super Saiyan. But unlike future Super Saiyan forms, since this form was just in the movies, it's really hard to say how it would be used after being unlocked. But it really seems like a form that would only happen if you were angry enough, uh, pretty much if the right triggers were there to, uh, to unlock it. It's not one that you use at will. But of course, it's going to be vastly outclassed by the real Super Saiyan form uh, that eventually Yang will unlock. Also, last episode, I teased pretty much Operations Aesops and Operation Scorpion. We'll learn a little bit of what those are in this episode. Um, if you guys did not watch the wedding podcast episode, horror stuff for the month of October is coming. Uh, it's coming next week. Also, me and Jess are going to finally start trying to get Ruby Ice Queendom reactions up on the channel. Um, so just be patient. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. So uh, we're on the airship to Atlas. Now, of course, we didn't see much of the traveling in the show, but we're led to believe that it, it was a little bit because they left during when it was still daytime and they didn't arrive in Atlas until night had fallen. But we're looking at at least a few hours. Um, Blake still apologizes for not being able to take the, the tower down, but once again, you know, Yang tells her, uh, don't be, this is not your fault. She comforts her. Uh, Blake uh, welcomes that comfort, you know, slowly but surely we are moving into a romantic relationship with these two. And uh, Ruby and the others decide to fill in to Blake and Yang what they missed. Uh, and technically, this is pro. I'd say that Team Juniper knows as well by this point, just like they found out in Argus in the original show. And so they tell him pretty much what they learned about Salem from the relic. And this version of Salem was still kept locked away, but it wasn't because of the reasons that was said in the show where her father saw her as his greatest treasure. And so he wanted to keep her locked away, safe from the world. Um, but this version has a much darker past um she had both of her parents in this timeline and they were ashamed of her and that is because this version of salem was not born with magic nor was she born with anything like a semblance this salem was born being able to use key energy at birth and so she was already probably the most strongest being on Remnant when she was born. In many cases, you could say that she was one of the very first key users that would later inspire uh, martial artists like Gia. Now, even though this version of Salem is not immortal, she has still lived for a very long time, and that is because of what will eventually happen. But, um... This version of Salem did not meet Ozma, did not have the love background. Um, in a lot of ways, she kind of has the same kind of background as Cinder does, in that um, she wasn't treated as 
the king and queen's daughter, she was treated like a slave in a lot of ways, uh, to clean rooms, to not really be seen by anybody, um, to the point where people were wondering if this king and queen actually did have a daughter because she was never seen until eventually she just snaps and kills her parents, kills everyone in the castle, destroys the castle, leaves. Um, and at first she saw this as a welcoming release. She was happy finally, and she could finally see the world. But this, ver but pretty much this version of Salem saw what the world was, and she saw the worst of it. War, murder, other crimes, betrayals, all that. People taking advantage of others, including herself, and she just ended up really j basically developing a hatred for humanity to the point where she wondered if it would be better just to wipe them all out. Um, and that is when she comes to pretty much where Salem is in the show and she had already been told about these pools of grim what they had in them what could become of somebody if they jumped in now what someone had told her that if someone was able to survive jumping in the pool they would be granted untold power and so thirsting for more power she jumps in and she survives and we pretty much get the Salem that we have in the original show, except she is not immortal, but she has pretty the the Grim Pool pretty much extended her life, but she is not immortal. She can die uh, by anything else, but it slowed her aging progression, extended her life, and so she has seen many decades, but she's also used those many decades to grow stronger. Um, and Ruby pretty much tells Yang that they were warned to never cross her path. Um, pretty much told if she does eventually decide to act on taking over the world, just accept it. Don't try and fight her. Pretty much how King Kai warned Goku not to approach Frieza. Though Salem is very much way stronger than Frieza. Now, Ozpin's role is pretty much the same as it is in the show. Pretty much the gods, whether you want it to be the brothers or, since we're going a little bit with Dragon Ball rules, if there's a realm of Kais, are the ones that pretty much chose a already dead hero to save the world from Salem. And this, but pretty much this version of Ozma has fought Salem for many years. But instead of him just living out life after life after life, she's pretty much killed him every single time. And they pretty much keep respawning him at this point, to the point where Ozpin has kind of just given up. That's what, In this version, that's why he t uh, became the headmaster of Beacon. It wasn't in some scheme to defeat Salem, like to find others to beat Salem, he pretty much gave up on his mission and pretty much just decided if I'm going to live lifetime after lifetime, I might as well do it on, on my own terms. He pretty much gives up. In a, and, you know, Ruby and the others see him as a coward. And um, since he was killed at Beacon by Cinder, he is now an Oscar. And Oscar is his current incarnation, just like in the show. Um... But the day that Yang came to Beacon to see Ruby, it kind of did light a fire in him because he knew from the very beginning that Yang was not from Remnant. Um, there was just something about her. She was raw power and raw strength uh, incarnate. He, like, he had never seen anyone besides Salem to have that kind of strength. And so it kind of rekindled his hope that maybe... Yang would be the key to defeating Salem. And since Salem, by her way of being of being in the Grim Pool, lets her control Grim and pretty much gives her Grim characteristics, he also saw that in Ruby as well because of her silver eyes. 
Uh, so after hearing this whole story, you know, Yang, of course, wants to fight Salem. Because just like any other Saiyan, she wants the challenge. She wants to fight strong opponents. Um, you know, of course, characters like Weiss are like, are you an idiot? Did you not hear what we just said? Um, but of course, Yang is like, well, we can't just let her do what she wants, you know? We have to get stronger. We ha like Together, I'm sure that um, we could defeat her. And, uh, you know, Crow is, of course, like, well, love your moxie, kid, but it just it just does not sound like it's ever going to be possible. But then again, they only Blake is the one who saw Yang's power up against Adam. Blake stays quiet, but right now she, and maybe Ruby, because Ruby, being Yang's younger sister and all that, they know how strong Yang is, and they're like, well, maybe. Uh... Maybe if Yang continues to get stronger and we all get stronger, maybe we could stand a chance against him. But before they can really talk about it anymore, they uh, get the notification that they have arrived in Atlas. Now, in the show, we saw them arrive with pretty much the military on watch for an attack. In this version, things are turned up way more. Ironwood has become so paranoid, not just because of Salem, because of course Ozpin told him about Salem, but also he still fears that Yang is one day going to go rogue and they're going to have another superpowered being um, to worry about. So Atlas and Mantle have pretty much become, in my best way I can describe it, a city, a, a government, a military-controlled city-state. He has pretty much turned Atlas and Mantle into a military compound, in a way. Um, not so great things are going on here. Um, so they already realized that, yeah, we need to keep a low profile right now, because who knows what exactly is going on right now. Um, so they do the same, they pretty much avoid detection getting in, and they're making their rounds, and Maria, of course, wants to go see Pietro. And so they do, just like they did in the original show, because she needs her eyes fixed, and the moment Pietro sees Yang's gauntlet, he knows who she is. Because while he was making this for her as a gift, as a thank you, for helping save Beacon, Ironwood approached him. And Ironwood wanted him to put some kind of foul safe in the gauntlet that if she ever got out of hand, there would be a way to... Best way I can describe it, kind of like a shot collar that people, for some reason, put on their dogs. Don't do that. Um, as a way that if she ever got out of line, there would be a way to uh, take her down. And Pietro... It was like this girl's a hero. She's not a she's not our enemy. She's not gonna do anything like that. Um and pretty much he told Ironwood no. And in this version, Pietro is pretty much trapped in mantle. He cannot go up to Atlas. And another thing that he holds against Ironwood is that Ironwood took Penny, which he, they, he doesn't tell them that yet because for Ruby, Penny is still dead. Um, but the new version of Penny, pretty much that version of Penny that everyone made art of in the past where like she would show up as a villainous character who didn't know Ruby, that's kind of what Ironwood has tried to turn her into. Um, in this version, he has already recruited Watts for Project Aesops and Project Scorpion which, of course, are both fail-safes in case Yang attacks. So, of course, when he sees her gauntlet, he makes the same, you know, thing that, oh, you painted it, you know. Uh, in this version, Yang catches on very quick. Oh, he's the one that made it. And then the alarms go off. And just like in Ruby Volume 7, the Grim attack and everyone takes part in protecting the... Um, uh, city. And just like in the show, Penny shows up. And of course, we have the same reunion between Penny and Ruby. 
But remember, Penny never met Yang in this version. The moment Penny sees Yang, she attacks. Yes, Penny has been programmed now to attack Yang. Now, of course, being a Saiyan, Yang puts up a really good fight. Um, I would not say Penny is stronger than Yang, but being a artificial being, she does not get tired. She does not have what we would say energy that she can waste. She literally has an unlimited supply. Plus, she has an aura and all that. So, yes, Penny attacks Yang. And they start fighting all over the place, in the streets, up in the sky. And of course, this notifies Ironwood that Yang is in Atlas. And he goes into full lockdown mode. Um, he pretty much tells Watts, get the Aesops ready. She's here. We need to take her out. And um, pretty much in this version, the Aesops pretty much have been turned into cy uh, cyborgs, or androids, as they were called in Dragon Ball Z. Um, they were Ironwood's top military personnel that he pretty much gave to Watts to, without their permission, experiment on them. And pretty much he put cybernetics into them to enhance their strength. Um, they now no longer age. They are organic, but they have non-organic parts in them that make them stronger. They don't run out of energy. Um, they And at this point in time, not all of them. They, they vary in strength, where you could say more than likely Clover is the most strongest. You'd probably think, no offense to him, he's probably one of my favorite characters in the show, but... Marrow might be the weakest at this point. Um, now, as far as how they feel about their enhancements, um, Clover being the most loyal to Ironwood is fine with it. Um, Harriet was also all right with it. Um, at first, eventually she starts to regret it. Um, Elm, gung ho as always, um, but she deep down resents Ironwood for doing this to her. Um, fine as of right now, since a lot of people have always said he was kind of the most robotic out of all of them, this kind of fits him like a glove. Marrow, on the other hand, is this, is right now purely against what was done to him. It done again against his will um was lied to they were they were all lied to about this they were just told it was going to be some kind of special training when they were pretty much drugged and experimented on um to be made stronger just because ironwood is scared to death of yang pretty much ironwood and watts together are kind of pretty much the dr jero of this story and the Aesops all together are the androids 17 and 18, 16, 19, if you want to say, because that's the reason why 17 and 18 resented Dr. Jero so much. They were pretty much humans that he experimented on and turned into androids. Um, and pretty much they are his first wave. If they fail, he has Project Scorpion. Project Scorpion right now is remaining dormant. So this whole time, while he's activating his new androids, Yang and Penny are continuing to fight. It's not, it is not until Ruby finally gets in between them, almost getting very, very hurt herself, and tells Penny to stop. This is my sister. Why are you attacking her? And in that moment, Penny being so special that she is, she breaks through the programming for just a few minutes and says she's sorry, then flies away. And so now we know that Penny is alive, but Watts and Ironwood have gotten their claws into her, for lack of a better term. And we also learn in this moment that Pietro 
very much wants to get back at Ironwood and um, Watts. And so seeing as how they're pretty much going to be going up against Ironwood at this point, because what else can they do? They can't go to him if this is all going on. And so Pietro decides to lead them to a secret place underneath Mantle, where he pretty much has continued his work. He also mentions Robin and the Happy Huntresses, who have also been fighting uh, Ironwood's control over the city, uh, but they are busy right now. And so he takes them down below, and like it's pretty much a hidden laboratory. Um, he's made it to where it can't be found by normal means. Um, there's shielding, so even though he is not an expert in it, he hopes that if anyone looks for Yang's energy s signature, it won't be able to be seen while down here. And so he tells them that a lot of weird things and awful things have been going on ever since Ironwood came back from the Vital Festival uh, when the Fall of Beacon happened. And he says a lot of it had to do with Yang. Um, he was handed, Pietro himself was handed a lot of footage on Yang. And um, they all very quickly realized that Yang was more than likely not of this world. And she pretty much says, yeah, you're right. Apparently my mom is an alien and I'm part alien. Um, which to a lot of them, that's news to them. Even for Ruby, that's like, what? You know, but dad said you were a faunus. And she, she's like, no, he was. he came up with that story to protect me. My mom says I'm what is called a Saiyan, and she pretty much gives everyone a uh, rundown on what that is. And uh, even though Ruby doesn't want to believe it first, she kind of puts two and two together that that makes sense why Yang is so strong and she can do a lot of the things that she can do. And, um, you know, Pietro asks her, you know, how do you get so strong so fast? And she tells him about the... Um, room that her mom created using gravity dust and he thinks for a moment he says you know what i think i could do the very same thing um but if you're going to get any stronger from it you need to go beyond 100 times normal gravity i need to make it stronger to where you can go as as high as you want to um but he says to do that he needs some special parts that he sent robin and the happy huntresses to get and so they decide that Ruby, Weiss, Blake, and Yang, unofficially finally forming Team Ruby, are going to go help uh, Robin and the Happy Huntresses because they're late. They are nowhere to be found. They were supposed to be back hours ago, and yeah, they're in. Pietro's kind of worried. And so. Team Ruby decides to go to where they were sent, pretty much to a supply depot where a lot of weapons and other things were, uh, were being held, and they were supposed to grab what they could before destroying the place so Ironwood can't use what is there. And when Yang and the others arrive, it's quiet. Like There's no sign of anyone at first. But for their investigation, they find the Happy Huntresses and Robin all knocked out, and that is when the Aesops make themselves known. And Yang already realizes that she doesn't sense anything from them. She doesn't even sense, like, normal energy that she can feel from Ruby and White. Ruby, Weiss, and Blake. And so, um, the Aesops introduce themselves. And Yang notices right away that Clover's eyes kind of, they do this thing kind of like a scanner. And um, he looks at the others and says, looks like we found her target. She's the one we're supposed to take out. And um, they quickly attack. And of course, at this point in time, Yang is no match for the Aesops. They are faster. They're stronger. They have unlimited energy. Um, it's pretty much a cat and mouse game at this point where she is just avoiding being killed at this point. Of course, Ruby, Weiss, and Blake try and help, but they are also very outclassed at this point by the Aesops. 
Thankfully, Robin and the others start to wake up and they see what is going on. And Matt, um, Robin quickly uses a flash grenade to try and distract the Aesops, but of course they're androids. They their their eyesight is not going to be affected by this, but it does give them time for May to effectively use her semblance to get them out of there, plus what they've uh, scrounged up thanks to Fiona's semblance. And so even though the the Aesops could easily follow them because they've also got super hearing, they could hear them running away, Bover tells them no, let's let because he wants to have fun with it. So they they kind of all want to. Like killing her now, what what fun would that be? We're pr we would pretty much miss out on a lot of fun, so let's let her live for now. One thing that Shonen villains make is that either they've got a clear win and they spend the time talking and end up getting beaten or they let the, the heroes go because they want to have more fun beating them up. And so uh, they arrive back to Pietro and yeah, no one's in good shape at this point. Even Yang took a good licking from the Aesops. Um, so he tells them to rest while he goes through what Robin and the Huntresses were able to get. And of course, they got a good bit of gear and stuff like that. One of them just so happens to have new clothes. And so that is how Team Ruby finally gets their Atlas outfit. So now Yang is rocking the bomber jacket. And of course, Yang finds an all new gauntlet similar to the one she's got, except, you know, pretty much how her gauntlet, her arm looks in the Atlas arc. And so she quickly snaps that on, and it makes her already feel stronger. Even though she knows that it's going to take a lot more than a new armored gauntlet to fight the Aesops. And so, Pietro pretty much talks them into laying low for right now, rest, lick your wounds, and come out with a plan on how to do this. Because not only does Ironwood have Watts, the Aesops. They also have he also has Penny. It is also during this time that Weiss learns that Winter has already turned on Ironwood and is leading her own resistance against him. Um, but right now, there's no way they can reach Winter because she's too far away. They would be caught by the Aesops or Penny at this point. Ruby says that they're that she knows she can get through to Penny. But Pietro's like, right now, with what Watts and Ironwood have done to her, it wouldn't last long. And I really don't want you all having to put any down. Um, so, yes, they know they need a plan. On Yang's mind, all she is telling herself is she needs to get stronger, and she needs to get stronger fast. She needs to finally unlock what her mom was talking about. She needs to become whatever it is, a Super Saiyan. And so she tells him, how long will it take you to get this gravity chamber up and running? And he says, in a couple of days, which she groans. She doesn't want to wait that long. But Blake puts her, her hand on Yang's shoulder and says, hey, just you need to rest. Please do it for me. And Yang kind of blushes and says, OK, OK, um, I'll do it. And uh, so, yeah, over the last few days. Stuff happens like the new hairstyles, new outfits, and all that. Uh, we still get Yang uh, gushing over Blake's new short hairstyle. Um, you know, once again, Blake asks her, is it bad? And which Yang's like, no, no, it's good. It's great, you know, uh, doing it all flushed like that. And um, since the others can't really stand the intensity of gravity training, they're using this time to train within the laboratory because Pietro would have a space, an open space, um, where they could train in, where he would like test things. And he starts working tirelessly to get this chamber ready for Yang because she needs to get more strength now. Because not only do they have Ironwood and all this to worry about, there's also Salem who is still out there. And also, when they were learnt, when they were talking about Salem, 
They also revealed that, yes, Cinder, as of right now, is working for Salem, but we all know, as the show has went on, that Cinder has her own agenda, and in this version, it is solely getting every bit of the Maiden powers, because she believes if she can get all four Maiden powers, that will put her up there with Salem, and she can dethrone Salem and rule the world herself. So with that, a few days go by, and finally Pietro finishes the gravity machine. This one can go up to at least 500 times normal gravity, and Yang right away starts her training. And that is where we will end today's episode. Next one will be more training, and of course, will Yang finally unlock the power of Super Saiyan against the Aesops, and will it even be enough? We'll have to find out next time. Hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, click that like button, leave me a comment. As always, guys, this is Kanan. Me and Jess love you all very, very much. Stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next one. See ya.